This morning we return to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and next Sunday, Lord willing, we will complete this study of the gospel and 1 Thessalonians. In a moment, we're going to read verses 1 through 11 in just a moment. We have a fascination, don't we, with figuring out the future? Some consult mediums, palm readers, and horoscopes to kind of figure out and learn their fate. Others search the Bible and study the alignment of the stars and the colors of the moon to discern the date that Jesus is coming back. And the Bible's silence on the matter hasn't kept preachers and self-proclaimed prophecy experts from actually setting dates. One of the most famous of the 20th century was detailed in the book, 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming in 1988. You remember that book by Edward Wisenhut? By the way, he was wrong. And who can forget, I mean, all the doomsday predictions that surrounded the turn of the millennium. And do you remember why to what? Okay, exactly, year 2000. Now, we tend to laugh off all the failed predictions, but they have very real consequences. Jennifer Gerber, director of the Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival, was profiled in the Sunday, October 11, high-profile section of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. It told how that after a year and a half at Henderson State, she decided to take a year off from college and to combine her artistic skills with her evangelistic upbringing, she joined a troupe a traveling Christian troupe for the entirety of 1999 with about 40 other college students who made stops at churches and schools in each state performing religious theme skits, some with doomsday messages as Y2K and the new millennium approached. It was a little bit like a cult-like mentality, Gerber said of it. See, they were cut off from contact with family and what was going on in the world. I felt deceived, Gerber said. I really believed the world was going to end. I believed we were going to make a difference on the tour, she said. On December 31st, 1999, she hunkered down while others were partying in the millennium. She was ready for the apocalypse, but guess what? It did not come. And here's what she said. For the first time, I believed something that wasn't true. It opened the door for me to question things. Let that sink in. Bible prophetic texts do not point to a date. They point to a person. They reveal who Jesus is, not when he is coming back. This does not diminish the promise of his return. Instead, it urges preparedness for his return. Return. The objective in preaching Bible prophetic text is always clarity and comfort. May God grant us those things from this text. If you're physically able, I'd invite you to stand with me as we hear the word of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. 
But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Pray with me. Father, we come to you this morning in the midst of shootings and mail bombs, in a world that is filled with tension. We come to you, Father, in a culture in America where there is toddler behavior among politicians, regardless of party, division among ethnic groups, hatred. And violence. We come to you as a people with failing bodies and with grieving families. And Father, we need a word from you. Father, we pray not only for us, but we pray for churches around us. And this morning we lift up in particular Central Baptist Church and their good pastor, Brother Mike Seaball. And we ask that there and in gospel churches throughout Columbia County today that you would speak from your word. That, Father, you would do for them what we're asking for here. Give us clarity and grant us comfort. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We see the apostle talk about Jesus coming as a thief in the night. Now, if you grew up in the 1970s like I did, you probably probably remember the reel-to-reel film, A Thief in the Night. It was popular at youth rallies and such. If you didn't, just think left behind without Nicolas Cage. You know, the rapture. Clothes lying everywhere, driverless cars crashing, and pilotless planes falling to the ground. The problem with our attempt to dramatize the day of the Lord is that in so doing, we end up diminishing it. All of our literary and cinematic creativity cannot capture the depth and extent of God's wrath upon those who live in darkness as captured in the simple Bible statement that we read, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Now, Jesus reminded us of the days of Noah, didn't he? People were eating and drinking and getting married. In other words, they were getting on with what? With life. Genesis 6, which tells the story, reveals to us a culture, a culture where people were getting on with life without any thought for God, which is in and of itself a life of evil actions and wicked intentions until until the judgment of the deluge of the flood and none except the family of God's grace Noah his wife kids and spouses none except the family of God's grace escaped we know the times and the seasons As believers, we know that the spirit of Noah's day is alive and well 
in our American culture even now. And we know that like a thief in the night, the day of the Lord will come, not with a flood, but with the full fury of God's righteous judgment leading to the lake of fire, eternal hell. And for those who reject the gospel, there will be no escape. This is not a plot for a novel or a movie. It is the very real judgment of the very real God upon very real rejectors of Him and His Son, Jesus. But we, we are children of the day. Now, my wife, my wife surprised me for my 40th birthday, which amazingly is almost... 12 years ago now? Is that right? Man, I'm getting old. Here's the thing. She and my deacons lied to me. Now, can you believe that? My birthday is in December the 6th. If you want to go ahead, I will pause while you put that in your smartphone. (laughs) December 6th. I was told we were gathering for our annual deacons Christmas party. It's December. It sounded reasonable. I thought, okay, that's what we are doing. That's why we're going to Dawn and Betty's house. And then the door opened, and as Gomer would say, surprise, surprise. Yeah. How were they able to pull that off? They kept me in the dark. But you are not in darkness, brothers. For that day, the day of the Lord, to surprise you like a thief. We who are believers in Jesus Christ, we have been delivered out of the darkness into the light of Christ's glorious kingdom. We know God. We see because we know God. We see because we know His Word. We see, we know that Jesus is coming and we should not be surprised by His arrival. Not because we know the day and the hour, but because we live every day ready to see him any day that he may return. That's the force of verses 6 and 7. Because we know he's coming, but not when we keep awake. We are watching and, he says, sober. In verse 8, Paul reiterates this call to soberness. Be sober. Now, we might wonder, is is alcoholic inebriation Paul's only concern in this text? And the answer to that would be, while it is certainly a concern, soberness is actually here about the whole, the entire picture of how we live our lives. It's about curbing the influence of our emotions and desires. It's about being well balanced in how we think and in how we live. It's about having a clear head. It's about living under control instead of out of control. It's about being restrained in our behavior and in our words, in what we do and in what we say. It is about exercising good, sound, reasonable judgment. And having been delivered from the darkness of not knowing God and stumbling around in that darkness to the light of knowing God and seeing His Word and seeing Him and seeing life clearly now, having been delivered into this confidence that we have knowing that God is going to send His Son Jesus to come back and bring us to Himself as we looked at a couple of weeks ago in 4, 13 through 18. Christians knowing all of this should be the calmest, most thoughtful, restrained, sane, well-balanced, reasonable people on the planet. Now, does that describe us? Does it describe Christianity at large in American culture today? And if not, why not? Let me show you three things that we need to do from the remainder of this text to help us be watchful and sober. First of all, we've got to apply the gospel. Much like a modern bulletproof vest that is worn by 
police officers and soldiers, the soldier's breastplate protected what? The heart, right? And figuratively, the heart is the keeper of our affections and desires which get all tangled up in one another. And as children of the day, as children of the light, as people who know God living amidst the darkness of the world, the danger for you, the danger for me, for all of us is that the allurements of the darkened world will affect our affections and affect our desires. That we will long for that which will take our eyes off of Christ that we will long for that which, though it promises to make us happy, in the end will serve only to rob us of our joy in Christ. So how do we protect our hearts? Faith and love. Faith, believing God, trusting His Word, confidence that His commands are for our good. God is not fencing us in by His commands to keep us from joy and happiness. He is fencing us in to keep us from harm and hurt. We trust the God who made us knows us. We trust the God who redeemed us loves us. We believe That our heavenly Father knows best. Faith and love. Setting our affections and our desires on God. Not not obeying Him with a gruff, okay, I'll do whatever He says. You know, like the sixth grader being told to take out the trash. Whatever. No, no. Loving the God who made us. Loving the God who redeemed us. Rejoicing in Him who is guarding us by His commands. Glorying in Him and in His goodness. Finding our soul's soul satisfaction in Him and Him alone. Faith and love guards our hearts. And the helmet, well the helmet obviously protects the head And the gray matter, right? That's within the head. Our minds, our thought processes are so easily affected by the darkness of the world that surrounds us. We are distracted by temptation. We are discouraged by our circumstances. We are confused by the culture in which we live. So the question is, how do we protect our minds? And Paul's answer is hope. The hope of our salvation, our deliverance in Jesus Christ. And what is that hope? That hope is simply this. Jesus died. Jesus lives. Jesus is coming again. And so we who believe in him will all together be with him forever. This confident expectation keeps us from despair, keeps us from giving into temptation in the midst of that despair, in the midst of a despairing and darkened world. We must apply the gospel. We've got to believe God and love God, and we must have our hope sustained. To do that, we must appreciate the gospel. Children of God, now listen to me. Children of God, we are not destined to suffer God's wrath. Our destiny is eternal deliverance from this darkened world into the kingdom of God where Jesus is the eternal light. God will not make us, you and me as believers, experience His wrath because Jesus experienced it for us in our place, on our behalf, on His cross. Do you get that? Do you appreciate that? God himself, God himself stepped in and saved you 
from his own wrath upon you that you justly deserved. So that, as we saw two weeks ago, whether you are awake, that is alive, or whether you are asleep, that is dead, when Jesus returns, you will live forever together with the one who bore God's wrath on your behalf. Stunning. Unimaginable. But true. And appreciating that gospel allows us to assure one another in the gospel. As stunning as the gospel is, these bodies of, in these bodies of clay that you and I live in, we still get stuck, don't we? Hung up, mired down in this world. Your health, grief, family, Job, money, all this violence that's going on, deceit, political climate, and on and on. What can we, what can we say to one another to encourage one another? How can we build one another up in faith, love, and hope that will protect our hearts and our minds? What do we got when we are discouraged and despaired from living in this darkened world? What we've got is clarity and comfort in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what we say, and I'm saying it to you this morning. I'm saying it to some of you in particular who are feeling it this morning. I'm saying, come here, brother or sister. All this that's got you down, discouraged, and disheartened, this is not your destiny. Jesus died. Jesus lives. Jesus is coming again. And whether you live to see it or whether we plant you in the ground and you go to hang out with Jesus in the Spirit for a while, when He comes, all us believers are going to get new, immortal bodies And we're going to live with him forever in a new world where God himself will wipe every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain. Every tear gone, every former thing passed away. And that, my brother or sister, that is your destiny. No, I don't think some of you are getting it. I mean, I know right now, some of you, you're feeling the pain. Right now, some of you are feeling the hurt. Right now, some of you are feeling the confusion. Right now, some of you are anxious about where you are and what's going around. And right now, your mind is reeling even as I preach with the darkness of this world and its effect upon you, upon your spouse, and your parents, your kids, upon those that you love and those who are around you. I know that. And some of you, well, you're just glazed over like a Christmas ham anyway. But I want to tell you this morning again, all this... It's not your destiny. I'm going to tell you again, and let's pray that we all get it, that ladies and gentlemen, whether you live to see it or not, whether we plant your body in the round and you go out to hang with Jesus for a while in the Spirit or not, when He comes, all of us believers, all of us who have trusted Him, all of us who have been delivered into the kingdom of light, all of us, we're going to get new bodies immortal, perfect, and glorious. And we're going to be with Jesus who died on the cross for our sins in our place. He who bore that wrath of God on our behalf, we're going to be with Him forever in a new world where God Himself 
is going to reach down and wipe every tear from your eye. Death is going to be no more. There's going to be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. All the former things are going to pass away. I tell you again, brother or sister, that is your destiny. Some of you will get it on the way home, I pray. Oh, man. How can that not thrill your soul? That is the comfort and clarity of this text. Is it your destiny? According to Acts 17, when Paul went to Thessalonica, he told them from the Scriptures that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and be raised from the dead. And that's what he's reminded them of in this letter, isn't it? And many, when he went there, believed what he said. They believed that Jesus suffered for their sins. And during the righteous wrath of God on their behalf. And that he rose from the dead. And you know what? Nearly 2,000 years later, this preacher is standing in this pulpit telling you the exact same thing. (laughs) The question is whether or not you're going to believe it. Will you believe Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, took your place, suffering God's wrath on your behalf on the cross, and that He lives? Will you believe that? I can tell you what Jesus said from His very own lips in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the question is, will you come? Not to a church, not to a preacher. But you come to Jesus. Because the only way to know the Father and to get to His house is through Jesus. So the only way you're going to get there is to come to Jesus. That's what I'm asking you. I'm asking you to come to Jesus. I'm asking you to believe, to trust who He is and what He did for you. I'm asking you to call upon His name, to cry out to Him, to confess that He is Lord, to believe that God raised Him from the dead. I'm asking you to come to Jesus. I'm asking you to do what we sing, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Will you come to Jesus? With our heads bowed, I'm going to pray for us. And after I pray, Brother Dustin and I are going to be here at the front. And if God's speaking to your heart and you need to respond publicly this morning, maybe right now you're praying that prayer. You're crying out to Christ. You're coming to Jesus right now. We'd love to visit with you about that decision. You can come during the invitation or after worship. You can grab one of us. And we'd love to visit with you about it. Talk to you about the decision to follow Christ. Maybe this morning you just, I've got to talk to somebody right now. And you come. We'll be happy to visit with you. Maybe you're wanting to be baptized and identify with Jesus. Maybe maybe you're wanting to join this church. Maybe you just need to come to this open altar pray maybe child of God God is working in your heart right now and it may just be that your response is where you'll be standing but you're just going to speak to him and you're going to look to him and you're going to rejoice anew and afresh in him that this world is not your destiny respond to him come to Jesus just come to Jesus Father, may your spirit right now accompany your word into our hearts and lives. There are saints who need encouragement. There are saints who need being built up right now in this service. And, oh, God, I pray that you would send your spirit to do that. May your word encourage us. We're feeling the weight of this world. Hearts are grieving. Minds are disturbed. Families are struggling. Father, we need your spirit in this place to bring clarity and comfort. 
And we need your spirit to convict sinners that they may be saved today. So God, come as we come to you just as we are. In Jesus' name. If you're able, would you stand? We're going to worship as we sing. If God is speaking to your heart, we invite you to come.